Welcome back to our third panel for today's Bio El Paso Juarez Summit. Um, this panel discussion is titled Digital Transformation of Medical Device Manufacturing, Industrial Applications of Immersive Technologies in Highly Regulated Industries. Um, as we've continued to work with the manufacturing sector here in El Paso and Juarez, we realize and understand the importance of technology adoption in order to remain a globally competitive industry. And so we're really excited today to have a wonderful group of panelists who are all locally based um, here in the region who are going to explore this topic with us, uh, teach us a little bit about what these emerging, um, immersive technologies are, and then we'll have a, a discussion. Um, we uh, have a, a, a moderator that I'm really excited to introduce you to, um, to help us uh, navigate these topics a little bit with our panelists today. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce him. Um, our moderator is Rene uh, Pons, uh, he's the founder at uh, PPAP Manager, a quality 4.0 solution to streamline and automate supplier quality processes in manufacturing. Uh, very timely to this discussion. Uh, uh, his is the first Mexican company to be selected in a Techstars acceleration program worldwide. Um, and they were the winners in the Bridge Accelerator program in 2020. Congratulations. Um, he's the former president and founder at the Chihuahua Information Technology Cluster, uh, community leader and facilitator at Startup Weekend, um, Startup Grind, direct, Grind Director of Chihuahua Chapter, um, uh, and mentor of the Global Entrepreneurship Challenge and design thinking expert. Um, uh, Rene is an innovation enthusiast, a serial entrepreneur in different industries, and a strong believer in the power of entrepreneur communities to achieve economic development. And I couldn't think of a better uh, person to, to guide us through this discussion today and to begin our panel discussion. Welcome, uh, Rene, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for, for inviting me. I, I'm thrilled to be here and to help how to navigate through this uh, adoption of these new technologies and, and how we can do it in the in the region and how it can work. And I, we have a really good set of panelists today that I want to introduce one by one. And they're gonna have a presentation of with their expertise and their vision about these emerging technologies applied into, into manufacturing. So uh, no further uh, introduction, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be uh, presenting John Alex Herrera uh, is the CEO and founder of New Discovery a digital agency with business units in industrial marketing for online positioning, immersive technology for manufacturing training, and film content for impactful communications. With 16 years of experience in marketing, tech, and film industry, John Alex has combined the benefits of these three pillars and led the new discovery agency team to create immersive experiences that achieve optimization goals for the medical and manufacturing industry. John Alex, I, I'm really glad to know you at last and, and to see what you can tell us about these immer uh, immersed technologies. I know that you've been around in this area for a long time uh, and you have a great set of, of skills in this area. And please, uh, John Alex, go, uh, join us and, and tell us a little bit more with your presentation about this, uh, these technologies. And welcome again. Thanks, Rene, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, uh, there, there are a lot of players here in the region doing, doing making some noise and really leading the way into, into what these new technologies can bring to the medical, medical and manufacturing industry, which is basically the core of, of what the region represents. And, and again, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the time. So um, if, if you allow me, exactly, thank you. So today, what I, what I would like to do is set the basis of what these, these technologies mean and, and kind of put us all on the same page of as, as far as terminologies and other um, general terms, uh, also how these technologies evolved to the point where they're now relevant uh, within the industry. So uh, let me start that presentation basically by, by pointing out the, the three main objectives of today. Uh, we'll do a really quick introduction of who we are and why New Discovery Agency, uh, represented by me, uh, should be talking about this and, and what we're doing in the region. Also, what are the immersive technologies and, and how to differentiate them? Also talk a little bit about of what virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality are in order to, to separate the benefits and, and the scope of each one. So New Discovery Agency, as, as Ren Renan mentioned in, in the introduction, we're focused on three main uh, industries here. So uh, we have three business units that take care of 
everything has to do with marketing and how we position companies that are providers of the industry sector where our, our focus is industrial marketing um, primarily and how we position them and help them uh, reach their target audience, which is essentially a manufacturing industry. On the tech side, we're completely focused on, on the manufacturing industry, the Johnson & Johnson, the BRPs. Um, how can we help them through these, these tools? And basically that's what we're gonna be touching base today. How can we help with them with these tools to really accelerate their induction and training processes? And on the film side, we're using all this experience on, of content creation and engagement to really uh, lead the way and integrate this into, into what these immersive technologies can bring. So what are immersive technologies? Um, essentially, all of these technologies are grouped within uh, the concept known as extended reality, so XR. Um, under XR, you're going to find VR, AR, and MR, virtual reality, mixed reality and augmented reality. As you can see, there's some overlap with, with you know, when we talk about these technologies and what you can do with, with the hardware and what experience you receive through the experiences in the software. So let's touch base on each one of them. Um, first of all, let's talk about the timeline and why, why now? Um, these technologies are not new. So essentially we've been seeing uh, different approaches to what uh, immersive tech can look like all the way back to the 1800s, really basic approaches as, as when we were looking at simple stereoscopic views. So uh, basically an image that has some displacement and when seen through a specific set of glasses can give you a, a feeling of, of depth and, and, and some sort of three-dimensionality only using an image. And that started evolving to the point where we involved uh, computer technology into this, but at the, when we're looking at the 90s, 80s, we're talking about entire rooms dedicated to to simple uh, simulations. But when we reach the, the 2010s, around the point where mobile phones are a big deal, and we've reached a certain point of of advancement in, in technology, well, this technology becomes more accessible. Uh, displays become richer in in the quality and and the realism they they can bring to us. Battery life is also uh, something that is that is important to this chipsets and and other integrations that make these these devices more accessible and we start seeing a different approach to what VR can look like. Um, companies like Microsoft take the lead with with uh, mixed reality and, and the Hololenses and augmented reality through that as well. Uh, Oculus is is bought out by Facebook, which injects tons of money into that and makes it relevant within you know w within the the early adoption conversation and all the way to the point where we're now looking at uh, the recent announcement of Meta, which is the, the evolution of Facebook. They're separating what they are as a company and what they are as, as an app. Facebook is only now an app and Meta is a company uh, which which is aiming to not only uh, talk, of, you know, revolve around the conversation of social media and and, um, you know, picture posting apps. We're now talking about the metaverse and this parallel uh, virtual world that can be accessed through their devices like Oculus and and other uh, implementations that they that they have down their their timeline. So, th why is this relevant? Because it's becoming it's becoming more user friendly, more accessible, and we're going to start seeing a lot of this uh, being mixed up in the work workplace. So, um, there there was a recent announcement that Meta and Microsoft now have a, a, a partnership. And this is only leading the way into, into these technologies, stepping into the workplace and becoming more, more common ground. Uh, for us that are on the other side of, of development and, and implementation, this is great news because we, we might be able at, at some point to skip uh, conversations like this that are, are maybe a bit basic for, for some. But uh, when, when we're trying to present the solutions and what impact these solutions could have in the industry, um, th there's still some a bit of a gap to you know from you know the, the team that is on ground and the team that is you know up the ladder in management understanding what how impactful these sort of solutions can be so uh, specifically speaking of what vr ar and mr and their differences are uh vr is of course virtual reality and the, this is basically uh to summarize it we use specialized hardware to completely occlude our real world and present it using uh basically two displays that serve as glasses within these HMDs or head mounted displays. They present to us completely virtual worlds that we are able to interact with using control. So as you can see in, in this, this loopable image, we have um, basically a, a person being trained on, on the operating room. They're using controls and they can completely see a 3D world around them. So interaction um, 
quote unquote, it's seamless. You're still using controls in your hands, so you're not touching with your fingers, but it, it is pretty accessible. When we move on to, uh, well, also how to use it is very relevant because this, this also is part of the conversation of implementation. So yes, a software can be very useful, can be, uh, can accelerate the process, but how many people do I want to train? How many headsets do I need to buy? So there's a couple of options depending on the, the level of graphic fidelity we're aiming for. Also the processing power. But these are these we're really getting to the point where these are becoming more and more accessible through standalone solutions like the Oculus or the HTCs. These are devices that no longer need or are, are no longer required uh, to be connected to the computer. You can you can still connect into the PC to get a, a, a more enhanced experience, but you're not required to do so uh, to to access this content. Now, speaking of augmented reality, these are these are. Uh, experiences that combine your real world with virtual elements. So now using devices like uh, maybe an iPad or a mobile phone, you can see virtual elements placed on top of your real world and actually through simple interactions like taps, swipes, uh, double taps, zooms, et cetera, you can interact with this content in a more natural, natural way. You're still doing this through the screen of a device, uh, which will lead us into mixed reality in just a second. Uh, so basically how to consume this content, mobile devices is, is basically the, the, the standard point uh, at, at this time. This is quickly changing. There's a couple of companies, including uh, Meta that are, and, and Apple as well, that are now uh, soon to release uh, glass-like augmented reality devices. And it's important for these to be more ergonomic and more you know, close to what we already use as, as glasses because um, we're still at the point where these are a little bit chunky so or, or clunky actually to to use in a more of a, on a daily basis. And last but not least, uh, we have mixed reality, which is a blend of the physical and digital world. So now you're able to interact with this content. Um, you can still see your real the real world through the transparent uh, holographic lenses that are in front of you. You can interact with them using uh, natural and very intuitive uh, you know, uh, gestures like maybe your hand, you're no longer uh, required to use a control. So this really opens the door for, for more natural interactions with this kind of content. How to use it? Well, we have two big players here, which is Microsoft, the HoloLens. We're now on version two. And the, the, uh, we have Magic Leap, uh, which at some point was really focused on entertainment, but they, they quickly realized that, that the market was, was leading towards, towards business implementations and, and they, they switched gears a couple of years ago. I think they fell behind, but those are basically the, the two major players there. Uh, the big note here is that this content, this is not only for video games anymore. Um, we're really, we've really passed the, the point where, where this is only for entertainment. Uh, VR and immersive technology is also considered one of the 30 uh, most important technologies of the next decade, which is which is pretty relevant, right alongside with which with AI, blockchain, uh, machine learning, and, and other technologies. And here we have a quick diagram that shows how to separate the type of content. We definitely have entertainment content. Uh, we have passive content and more interactive. But any everything that falls and we believe is relative to the industry falls under the the fourth quadrant, which is interactive and has uh, actual implementations and usage within the industry. So it's for it's more for induction, uh, production line trainings, therapy, calibration or collaborative designs, uh, medical pr procedures, etc. So so now we have actual interactions that 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 have uh, a real purpose, not only for entertainment. And this is what we're aiming for at some point to reach the, the, the goal of, of having completely virtual trainings that accelerate a st and standardize the training process for major industries. I think this, with this basis, uh, it's a good point to, to give way to, to the rest of the panelists to speak a little bit about uh, you know, what regulations and what implementations are happen happening locally. Really interesting, John Alex. I, I was reading uh, last week about digital twins and immersive technology. I don't know if you you, you were reading about it. How you uh, digital twins is a concept that has been around uh, several years ago, but how immersive technology goes into into this digital twin, the, this uh, factory uh, simulation that can help them to prevent and to predict errors and to predict production or whatever what do you think about that in in, in that area 
I think that uh, the, the most important thing here is that virtual implementations, both for training and for, you know, uh, predictive simulations will help us, first of all, optimize cost, time, uh, a, a number of things within, within the production line process or, or the, the manufacturing process of, of, of large industries, which is where the numbers start mattering. Uh, we, we, start, uh, we start seeing that these implementations, both for quality control and for, for reduction of scrap and, and of waste, start having a real impact on finances and, and on time, which is, which is where I think uh, companies and major uh, you know, upper level management will start, will start seeing the value of implementations like digital twins or, or, inclusive, or, or also collaborative uh, remote work through yep. virtual avatars and, and remote presence that is more uh, natural rather that we understand Zoom now thanks to the pandemic, but th there's an evolution to that that is really uh, more intuitive and more really, really presential. So, so I think that once we, those implementations start taking place in the work in, in the workplace, which is basically our day to day, we're going to start seeing a, an acceleration of, of what the impact these solutions have. And, and you said a really important trigger for any manufacturing company, saving, save, saving money uh, and how it's going to impact not only in the short term, but in the long term, because this simulation, these predictions is going to is going to help them to to avoid all the all, all the things that's gonna that they are waiting for to happen or, or to do in a, a, to avoid in it mm -hmm. instead of doing these simulations and, and and see what's going on in, in the yeah and, in the and once you combine that floor. yeah of course and once you combine that with machine learning and and AI this starts becoming a, a monster within itself so we start getting getting data from all sorts of angles not only from the training processes uh, to, to detect through machine learning and AI uh, recurring patterns and things that m might need to be adjusted within within the the regular production cycles, uh, but also running multiple simulations through these through these applications. You, you can get uh, you know th through this predictive data uh, you know better results on the implementations that need to happen on the workplace and the production and, lines. And, and one of my takeaways from from your presentation is that the, uh, this uh, extended reality, the uh, mixed reality, augmented reality, is been there uh, several years ago. So, mm -hmm. and, and most of the people know this as a fun thing, not not mm -hmm. as a, a, a specific uh, use thing for manufacturing for different uh, business cases. And I think we we need to move forward, move forward in in this specific area. And see and stop seeing it as a thing of uh, from for the future or from the future. It's time uh, start seeing it as a reality right now. So thank you, You're thank totally you, you and Alex. Thank you. Thank so you. so I, I, I'm gonna pass to my next panelist to introduce Marco. Uh, Marco is gonna talk a, a little bit more about uh, regulatory issues of, in, in the medical industry. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Marco. Welcome. Uh, Marco is a B, BPC Mexico Division Director. He oversees recruiting, account management, operations, and product delivery. Marco has over 12 years of experience in the medical device industry and has been led and been part of diverse and multifunctional, multifunctional teams. Marco's experiences include larger transfer programs, new product introductions, process development, engineering, operations, and external manufacturing. Uh, Marco is our, our process expert and is a well knowledge in engineering and how to understand customer expectations and needs. And Marco been around in, in this industry for, for several years. And uh, I, I'm glad to introduce you, Marco, and to, to welcome you here to the panel. And, and please share with you your thoughts about these regulatory uh, uh, issues around the medical devices manufacturing. Thank you, Marco. Yep. Uh, thank you, Renee, for the introduction. So let me just open up my screen and share it with you all. Um, okay, so, you know, I wanted to, to um, go into a little bit more detail into what John Alex just mentioned, right? Um, when you have this, this level of technology, which is very exciting to have uh, for any type of industry, you start to think about, you know, type of uh, solutions or the type of implementations that you can have in your processes to help you uh, make your, your process more robust. Um, but when you when you talk about medical devices or pharmaceutical industries, those are very highly regulated in the industry. So when you try to do any type of implementation as far as uh, new technology, 
um, you know, you have to ensure that your the technology that you're implementing is going to be matching up with the regulations. So what I want to share with you all is just a quick uh, thought on, you know, a, a, a potential um, application of the uh, technology that Genolix just shared with us. Um, and then just, you know, give you a couple of pointers on, you know, what the regulation would ask you as far as validation exercise for you to do a, an implementation of this level. So <clears throat> uh, what I wanted to share with you is a, a quick case study of, uh, you know, uh, um, a preventive maintenance routine. That's a very common operation that you have on, on, on any type of, of industry. Um, but if, on this particular example, I, I have a, a quick routine for a, a, a printer, which are, are a fairly, fairly common, fairly simple pieces of equipment, uh, but are very critical for the, op for the operation, specifically in medical devices, because you're going to have um, very commonly the, the device um, variable information is printed out of, the, of these printers. Uh, and when I said variable information, that's going to contain very important information like the unique unique identificator of, 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 of the device or the shelf life or traceability information that needs to be accurately um, printed and that needs to be legible throughout the use of the device or the shelf life of the device. So even though those, these are fairly simple pieces of equipment, you know, it's, it's highly critical to maintain them uh, printing correctly and adequately. So... Um, this this uh, piece of equipment, you know, have uh, prevented maintenance, which is a, a very common practice, or it's it's a common practice across, across industries. And in a nutshell, a PM would be a, a set of instructions that are executed on a, a established frequency, and it, those instructions are going to tell the user how to execute that routine. And it, it can be very very simple, like a cleanup of or, or or lubricating a piece of equipment. So uh, something very complex, like you know, disassembling uh, an injection molding uh, uh, mold, uh, and then taking it apart, inspecting it, and taking taking it and putting it uh, back again. So again, it's a it's 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 highly variable that the level of PM that you're going to see in the industry. Um, one thing that is very common though is that you would have the a specific department that's going to manage maintenance around the site. So your PMs are going to be executed very frequently, and this is not, you know, this is not for every industry, right? But very frequently, you're going to have a set department that is going to execute the PMs, right? And with that, there's there's a there's an inherent risk of when the, the individual executing that PM, um, their ability to follow the instructions that were captured in the, the preventive maintenance routine. So what I have with uh, what I have, what I want to share with you real quick is a quick video that we put together. Just you know, for this very simple piece of equipment, if you add interactive guided instructions, you know what can you do for the user, right? How can you improve the user experience and therefore mitigate the risk of potential machine downtime once the PM has been executed? So I'm going to share that video real quick with you all, um, and I'm, I'm just going to uh, because I know we're short on time, so I'll start it after we open up the software. Um, for this, uh, we're using uh, the HoloLens, which is one of the, te the, the uh, technology platforms that John Alex was mentioning. And we use the, the uh, Ho uh, HoloLens Guides, which uh, um, it's a, a software that's already within the Windows platform. So I'm just going to click on play, and I'm just going to let the video run.
Um, as, as you can see, as you all can see, right? So it's it, it takes those instructions to a different level. So you can overlap uh, quick videos with text instructions on top of the uh, hologram, and then you have the physical object. So it's going to guide the user uh, specifically to the points that you're looking for. And again, these are simple pieces of equipment, but depending on the application, depending on the industry, the, those uh, those pieces of equipment and the routines are going to considerably go, uh, um, are going to be considerably more difficult to execute and to execute correctly to minimize any impact to your, your production. So very quickly, um, you know, if you want to implement these types of solutions, right, you have to, for the medical device industry, you have to think of, about the, the guidelines that FDA has established for software validation. And, all, and uh, that's, this is just for U.S. regulation, right? But there's other regulations. But let's focus in on, on, on U.S. regulations because we, we have a, a short amount of time. So FDA is going to require that you do some sort of validation on your software, right? So FDA has two, two specific uh, definitions for software. So one is verification and one is validation. Uh, and really what we're going to focus in today is, you know, software validation. So in a nutshell, you have to provide evidence right, that your software is going to perform according to what the user needs it and what the, what the device is going to be used for. So you have to provide that, that level of evidence, right? It's not just, yes, it works. You have to provide objective evidence through data that it actually works and it's going to be working as intended. Um, there are a bunch of regulations applicable to this, but just for software validation, if we focus on that, you know, you need to you need to understand that software. It's not you know, it's just just like uh, uh, like Microsoft Windows, right? It's any component using the medical device, or it's that it's part of the medical device itself, or it's a part of the production of the device, right? Or the implementation in the device manufacturer's quality system. So when you talk quality system, PMs come into play, calibrations come into play, training comes into play, which is one of the uh, the use cases that John Alex mentioned. So not only not only if you if you you're going to be looking at doing something specifically for like the the medical device itself but are you going to be doing anything that that encompasses that medical device world or the or the uh, quality system you have to think about the regulations and as i said there's several regulations applicable to this but in a nutshell uh, 21 CFR 820 it's really where the medical device regulations from FDA is located, and then there's different different uh, chapters where you have where you can go in and, and look for more details. But <clears throat> essentially, the uh, eight twenty point seventy point seventy, um, it's you know it's a regulation that if if you're just gonna if you're gonna have software in your device, it needs to be validated. Eight twenty point thirty, device the medical device software needs to follow design control, which is another topic by itself. And you know again uh, twenty one CFR eleven. If you have any any software that used to create, modify, maintain electronic records, it also needs to be subjected to validation. So, again, regulations for software are very are very robust, are very similar to what you would see for product or process. Uh, that you know, if, if you want to looking into uh, implementing a, a technology like this, you will really have to do your homework to make sure that the uh, the, the validation is is meeting the regulation. Um, one thing that we would suggest though is you know as i said we developed this quick video with um an, an off-the-shelf platform meaning it's it's a microsoft based platform it's used on on their on their technology right so if you, you if you're using uh, an off-the-shelf software which fda defines as a, a a software component used by a medical device manufacturer for which the manufacturer can claim complete software life con uh, life cycle control then you can start thinking about validating that software using the off-the-shelf software guide guideline by, by FDA. And there are several things that you will have to take into consideration for you to actually validate your software or your application as an off-the-shelf software. But in a nutshell, what you need to be thinking about is that when you're doing your validation for your software, you know, risk, you need to think about risk and the controls that need to be applied to your validation. And then you have you have to think about this because any software failures that happen, you know, those, those are systemic in nature, right? You, you know, and I, I don't want to delve into too much, too many details, but if you think about validating and you're doing your DBMB exercise, 
those those failures are going to be probability based like meaning you know there's a certain probability that 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 event may happen right but in software that's not necessarily the case so that's why your focus for your validation needs to be on managing risk or risk management right and you manage that identify the severity of the harm of the potential um, failure of the software so uh, this is a quick schematic again this is from fda directly from the fda guideline it's going to walk you through how do i how do i know if my device um, classifies as an off the, uh, or my software rather classifies it as an off the shelf software and then what do i need to do to to, to validate that this piece of software right so um, FDA provides a very thorough guideline of this, and this is just a quick, quick um, summary of what of what they mentioned here. But in a nutshell, if if you have off-the-shelf software, which I tried to 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 explain uh, a minute or so ago, uh, you need to provide basic set of documentation, which is essentially what the software is, the version of it, uh, the platform that it's used to 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 run it, so on and so forth. And then the focus is going to be, as I said, on the on the on the uh, risk mitigation or risk management, uh, which FDA mentions that you have to look into the hazards, right? And then you classify your your software according to the level of concern of that software. And the level of concern is just, you know, in layman terms, they're just they're just trying to classify the software as, you know, if if something goes wrong, nothing is going to happen to the patient. If, if something goes wrong, you know, the patient can have a severe harm or potential death. So according to those classifications, you would classify your level of concern and then you, meet, you identify the level of validation that you need to do for your off-the-shelf software. And again, this is, this is very high level, but it's, um, these are, are from the guidelines that FDA has out there. Um, so we as BPC, what do we recommend, right? Um, we recommend that if you have this type of application and, and you want to you wanna implement it and make sure that your validation is going to meet regulations and there's going to be with in compliance, you know, <clears throat> when you're doing your, when you're thinking about your device and when you're thinking about the potential applications, um, you need to marry your uh, official software and the hazards analysis of that with your device hazard analysis. So any type of device in the medical device industry requires a hazard analysis, meaning you know, what types of, uh, what happens uh, to the patient if something goes wrong with my device, right? It can be something for um, a minor bleeding to something really, really bad, as I said, as, as potential uh, death, right? So you need to, you need to uh, make sure that those two go hand in hand. You don't have your software and then your device, no. Your hazard analysis must be software and device. And then you have to identify your level of concern or, or LOC as, as uh, FDA has um, um, established. Um, and the, something very important here is that you have to utilize the indication of that device. So a, a medical device can be really, really simple, like uh, a Band-Aid and uh, something really, really complex uh, as, an, as an implant to open up an, uh, an artery, right? So you need to manage that. You need to make sure that you understand the indication of the device and you understand the software and you understand the, you know, the, the dynamics between both. So then you can properly identify the level of concern. Um, the other pointer that we would suggest is, you know, you, you need to make sure that the documentation matches the level of risk. You know, there's such a thing as an overkill on the medical device industry, even though it's a highly regulated industry, you, know, you have to understand if what's your indication, what's your use, and then the type of documentation that you need to generate. You know, I wouldn't recommend you generating a very, you know, very robust software validation for some, for a very simple medical device like a Band-Aid. But if you're looking at a very complex uh, medical device with a, with a, a high level of uh, concern, then you have to make sure that you know you have a very robust system in place with a very robust validation. And then the last recommendation would be you know wherever possible leverage of the shell software and our vendor documentation. It's very common that vendors have done a lot of the lead work, uh, but it's very uncommon that we leverage that for our valid internal validations exercises. So. That is, in a nutshell, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of information and I try to be as, as, as thorough but as quick as possible. Um, a couple of references here, which again, as I mentioned, is FDA guidelines for off the shelf software or, or the uh, general principles, uh, principles of software validation. And, and that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for, for, for all the things that you talk about. I, I think this really important how 
how medical devices industry is going to be harder to get into into this type of technology because if it's hard to to get it into the traditional manufacturing uh, industry uh, not because regulation because adoption because culture because different things uh, how it's going to be harder to do it but we, we're going to talk about it in, in the panel about this and i'm going to ask you a little a couple of questions about about it thank you marco for for your presentation and we see you in the panel in a couple of minutes. Right now, I'm going to introduce Omar Saucedo. Omar is the Microsoft TechSpark Community Manager in Mexico. He brings his background in marketing, productivity, and quality systems, innovation, and strategy. Prior to his role in Microsoft, Omar worked for more than 10 years in Tech de Monterrey in extension programs where he focused in collaborating in the design and implementation of the automotive industry, business, academic, and government strategies. Over the last nine years, he has contributed to projects aimed to improve education, business capacities, economic development indicators in the Juarez of Peso area. And most recently, Omar served as Undersecretary of, Undersecretary of Innovation and Economic Development for the state of Chihuahua, and he was also director of Desarrollo Económico de Ciudad Juárez and coordinator for the border projects for the Border Project Alliance. Welcome, Omar. And we are looking forward to see what Microsoft could bring to the table to these emerging technologies and how uh, immersive technologies into the manufacturing area and how is uh, your labor with, with Microsoft uh, a way to introduce and to help this region to adopt faster uh, from the, the bottom of the the, the the pyramid, from the the, the people who are uh, just starting a, a high school, and to move forward into different levels of the of the uh, uh, of all the region, and how to get into the industry. So welcome, Omar, and thank you for for your time. Thanks so much, Rene, and congratulations to all the team of IOEPJ, uh, Emma, Jackie, and all the team. So uh, by doing this, you help us achieve our mission here. Uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but you know what, more than talking about uh, future or present technologies, um, this type of events are important for us because these events help, uh, you know, create more, more collaboration um, and more than sharing knowledge or general information, we want to share real examples and we want to uh, bring closer, especially to our entrepreneurs and our, our small companies. Um, you know, new technologies, we want to bring resources that our uh, local and regional ecosystem can take advantage of. They can implement and they can include in their business proposals. They can include in, in their uh, entrepreneurial efforts. They can include in the value they're trying to generate uh, on a daily basis. No, we, just, we don't want only motivation. Uh, we want uh, to to for one our ecosystem to start creating more value added using those type of technologies, and and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, uh, just uh, precisely uh, talking about real examples, we have a very special guest with us today, and I'll, I'd like to introduce you to Ivan Gris. Uh, so Ivan, thanks very much for being with us. So the key topic for us, uh, it's regarding immersed te technologies. And Ivan has worked in the region for uh, several years, you know, trying to help uh, our organizations uh, to start using this type of tools. So I invited Ivan uh, for him to share with us what is his opinion about how ready our region, our companies are regarding immersed uh, technologies. Thanks so much for being with us and please, uh, share these experiences that you have had over the last uh, recent years. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Omar, for, for inviting me. Hello, everyone. I, I saw a couple of familiar names in the chat, so I'm, I'm always glad to see these events going on. Um, this helps promote what's happening in the region precisely. And um, so for the past probably seven or eight years, I've been working with emerging technologies, particularly mostly with uh, uh, immersive technologies, right? Part of the extended um, reality spectrum that Jen Alex was talking at the beginning. And at first I did it at a research lab while I was pursuing my, my doctoral studies. And, you know, it was kind of when we were getting started, 
virtual agents, virtual environments. Uh, there was the technology was too new. There still wasn't a use. But the reason why I bring this up, it's because we had a team of about five or six people doing this before the Oculus even came out, right? And this was happening here uh, in Juarez and, and El Paso, really, uh, where our team was. And after after doing research for a while, you know, we we started our own company. We actually started two companies: one for entertainment, later switched to um, uh, industry, uh, healthcare, education, and we actually managed to develop and deploy probably about a dozen applications that are used across the state of Chihuahua, Texas, New Mexico. So it's something that's definitely happening here. A lot of people don't understand or don't believe that these things are actually developed here. Um, and it is it is pretty interesting. Um, most recently, I just joined, and I'm actually speaking to everyone from um, from the city of El Paso, where a new department was actually recently created called um, User Experience. And User Experience focuses on a lot of human computer interaction, how citizens, how departments interact with technology, and how we can use these technologies uh, for these particular cases. So, we did a lot of case studies, both in industry and education, and healthcare, all around. And usually, the process is you know, finding out the pain point or the problem, then finding out the resources that we have to tackle that problem, then adding resources if we need to, usually by reaching out to people like Omar, precisely, you know, that can connect you to uh, this sort of things, like to the Medical Center of the Americas, which we uh, visited quite often, um, to Pioneers 21, um, to Tech Hub in, in, um, in Juarez. And then basically you will find people and you will find solutions to those problems around the area. So I'm really glad that this is going on. I'm really glad that I was invited and had a chance of, of like I told Omar, my, my five minutes of, of fame and, and sharing this really seven years summarized and a dozen projects and over two dozen people working in these technologies um, that are actually right now making a difference, right? Educators are using this. We have training scenarios, simulations uh, all over uh, both countries. Um, and even further, if you count some of the research projects that we were doing. So don't hesitate to reach out, um, ask me how you can get involved. In fact, we even here at the city as a new department, we actually are hosting four new interns uh, right next to us who are actually getting started in these technologies and are already developing some stuff using geospatial information and a bunch of other services. So lots of things going on, lots of exciting things coming up. And I, I hope that that answers uh, your question. Omar. That's great, Ivan, and that's that's a real example, no? How our region is starting to change, uh, not only manufacturing but also government or other services. And and precisely, just like you're saying, I invite all our entrepreneurs or small or small businesses to see that we have uh, real players that are already managing this type of technologies. And I'll, thanks so much, Ivan, for being with us. Um, and please stay for the panel. Uh, let me see if you can share my if you can see my screen. Um, can you uh, please? Just let me know if you can see it. Ready, Omar, we see, we see your screen, go ahead. That's great, thanks so much. Well, um, after showing a real example that we have in the region regards uh, immersed technologies, I'd like you all to uh, take some time and, and watch this Microsoft Ignite event that took place uh, some weeks ago. Um, I'm just gonna describe a couple of examples that we got in this important event. Um, and I think these examples are key for everything we want to reach in our region. So basically during this presentation, you can see this event in, in YouTube, you just type uh, Microsoft Ignite 2021, and then you'll have to you have a chance to see um, the new tendencies that are going to be affecting our economy and our uh, culture and, and, and quality of life. So it takes like a couple of hours, but I think it's a very important event. So we're not gonna you know spend this this time. We have short time, but uh, just want to share a couple of highlights. And basically, it's. Uh, three uh, tendencies that uh, Satya Nadella, uh, Microsoft CEO, describes as part of the Microsoft Ignite. And uh, these tendencies, I see them uh, already starting to happen in our region. So one is uh, the effect that we have of the pandemic and how this is starting to increase what we call hybrid uh, work. 
And there's a couple of, of KPIs that he describes. And one is super interesting for me, which refers to um, the number of people that are willing to change a job uh, after using all these digital tools. So Satya describes that more than 40% uh, of people right now, they are willing to move uh, from their previous job. And that is because of the flexibility and because of the accessibility that most of the population um, have uh, regarding digital uh, tools and, and uh, you know, more connectivity. There's also something that is quite interesting to me uh, that he shows, and that is basically that people that are gonna return to the office uh, or people that are gonna stay at home doing work, you know, there's a big percentage of you know, both types of people that they are very interested in how they can uh, stay more focused and better achieve uh, you know, the job's objectives. Uh, those, those things uh, are important highlights that I want to share with you, but I hope that you, you have more time and you can take a look at the whole event. That's uh, number one tendency. The second tendency refers to hyperconnectivity and how uh, businesses have to prepare for um, being a better prepared to link the whole value chain from customers to production to suppliers. And that second tendency is precisely uh, one that we see that affects our region a lot. As you may know, uh, we have this great opportunity of improving the value chain integration in the region. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, more deeply, but um, we were previously trying to integrate, you know, production of solutions, uh, products, innovations, etc., from our region to the large industry. And now with this uh, hyperconnectivity, um, the new uh, tools that is, uh, that is bringing to the value chains, this gives us more opportunities, I believe, for our companies um, to be ready to deliver faster and better. But that depends on our companies and entrepreneurs to be ready uh, and to you know, be able and equipped with this type of tools. And the third tendency that is also very important uh, refers to digital businesses. Um, and that is also very related to our region and the challenge is how our businesses can integrate uh, their current technologies. So the three tendencies are starting to affect our region and um, fortunately in the region, we have um, both in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, uh, we have this very important initiative from Microsoft that is called TechSpark. So we got a text part in El Paso, one in Juarez. Uh, you may know JJ Childress, that is my counterpart in El Paso. And together, uh, what we do, JJ and I, is uh, to develop a, a regional economic development plans so that we, we can support our local ecosystem uh, to take advantage of the digital economy opportunities. So I'm gonna briefly uh, show, you know, what is the plan that we have a little bit more on the Juarez side so that we can help the digital transition that we need to have in the border plex. Um, so as you can see here, and you're very familiar with this, um, Juarez has an economic development model that depends a lot on the foreign direct investment, um, where we have uh, we still have more than 300,000 jobs that depend on, on basic labor, and we still have uh, many challenges with the average wage so that is one of the challenges that we have and we need to use you know, uh, technological tools to help both our companies and our workers to be able to generate more value added just as the second item says. Uh, we need to take advantage of all these companies that are located in our region. You know, We have more than 400 uh, manufacturing companies in very important sectors. And one of these key sectors is precisely the medical device manufacturing sector that we all know that Mexico and Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez, we are very important locations for these uh, type of industries, no? But just as, as it was mentioned before by John Alex, uh, by Marco and, and Ivan, uh, the medical device uh, sector is uh, one that is gonna require probably to advance faster in this uh, type of immersed technologies. Um, there's also another challenge that we have and we're working at towards improving that, which is aligning the capacities that we have um, between the academic and, and the industrial sector. No? So uh, tech's part in, in both sides of the border, we're currently focusing and supporting talent, uh, how to help uh, the economic uh, 
uh, regional areas that we have and to improve this model that we've got for about 50 years. We need to modernize it. That's part of the work we do. And in order to achieve that, um, we have several programs in the region. So one of, of the important focuses that we have uh, is how we can support our population to have access to reskilling or upskilling programs. Another one is how we can strengthen the innovation and entrepreneurship network and how our population can have also access to that ecosystem. Um, a, an important uh, initiative that we are also fostering is how we can grow the number of technological-based companies that we have in the region, and of course, connecting these small companies to the large industry. Another important uh, area that we're currently uh, supporting is the technical uh, design or research and development uh, centers or the advanced manufacturing centers. I'm going to describe a couple of them in a moment. Uh, a hanging fruit that we have to improve the local economy is precisely the you know regional uh, supply chain integration. Uh, some of you may know that we have a signature project in the region that is called the Bridge Accelerator, which is a platform that connects small companies with large industry uh, with that target that we have of increasing the supply base chain in more than 2% where we currently have it. And at the same time, uh, another important focus is how we can, you know, bring new type of technologies to our ecosystem. Immersive technologies is one example. And you know, immersive technologies is very related to AI and other technologies. No? So, uh, so our main function is how we can bring these type of tools to the region. And something we want to do is to collaborate a lot as much as we can with uh, the regional government, uh, regional institutions, but especially small companies, uh, industry and entrepreneurs based on the needs that they have. Our role is to help them, you know, be more aware uh, of what's happening worldwide regarding new technologies, but also uh, according to the needs they're having to help and bring resources uh, to Juarez and, and El Paso and, and Chihuahua not mainly. So basically what we look for at the end is to improve our you know, people, uh, household income, um, by ensuring that we have two important uh, pillars. One is digital transformation capacities and a talent-based uh, economy foundation. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of examples that we have in the region. Uh, these uh, two infrastructures that we have, uh, we've been working and collaborating with them since uh, many years ago. Fortunately, they are already here, uh, but these... Uh, couple of, inf of infrastructures are here to help achieve uh, the description of the plan I, I just showed you. One is uh, uh, something that we call CETA, or it stands for the Advanced uh, Technologies Innovation and Integration Center. So this center is located in the very border between Ju uh, Juarez and El Paso. And this center, I'm very proud to tell you that it's currently operated by the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico. And this is the very first uh, uh, innovation uh, center approved by the National uh, Council of Science in, in the country. And I'm very proud to tell you that this center is connected to a very important network that we have national wide in Mexico uh, that is connected to 23 states in the country, more than 1,000, uh, I mean, more than 1,200 uh, researchers uh, through Politecnico Nacional and with access to uh, to more than 12 research networks in the country. Research that have to do, for example, with the biomedical center. No, uh, This center was possible thanks to the collaboration of CONACYT, uh, of the state of Chihuahua government, and particularly what is called uh, the uh, Puentes Fronterizos uh, that we have here between El Paso and Juarez. Uh, thanks to those resources and the collaboration that we have with Politecnico Nacional, CITA is a reality. And uh, thanks to that, we are currently focused uh, on three main areas, information technologies, advanced manufacturing, and advanced electronics. And we are currently preparing eight labs, that these labs are going to be uh, accessible to the industry that we have in the region, and but also to entrepreneurs and small uh, manufacturing and small companies. Um, the way that CITA operates, uh, it's by Politecnico Nacional or the National Polytechnic Institute, but it's got a board integrated by 
the leaders of our regional industry. So most of the projects that are defined in this center, they have to do with the manufacturing capacities that we need to develop in the present and in the future. And so these eight labs and focus areas are related to advanced manufacturing, uh, artificial intelligence, EMC, addit uh, additive manufacturing, advanced computing, electronic prototypes, material analysis, and metrology. You know? So we have different phases uh, where we can now uh, work in the region. These uh, phases were just a dream in the past. So it, just one example, in order to increase the, the value chain in, uh, you know, integration or the percentage that we have, in the past, if one entrepreneur or a small company wanted to uh, propose a new component, a new part, uh, and they needed, uh, you know, technology to design uh, those components, it was very difficult for small companies or entrepreneurs, you know, to create this uh, proposition because they didn't have a place where they could do this. No, so basically, uh, before CETA came to this region, entrepreneurs and, and small companies. Uh, even though they wanted to make this type of more value-added uh, innovations or solutions, they were limited because they didn't have a place where do, they could do this. No, Now, fortunately, with CETA, they're going to have access to these labs and to these new capacities that are going to allow our you know, small companies, entrepreneurs, and industry to develop these phases, not only commodities, but also uh, you know, starting from design, development, development, manufacturing, prototypes, testing, which is important for us, and also uh, updating their processes with industry 4.0 technologies. Uh, thanks to this, we are currently improving the alignment uh, of, you know, the large companies that we have, but also connecting them with uh, small companies and entrepreneurs, and at the same time, bringing to the region certifications or uh, test the tests that we didn't have in the past. As you know, many of our companies, especially the biomedical sector, they had to do uh, different tests. They had to run tests in other parts of the world, in other cities, not in our region, but with CETA, they're going to be able to improve, uh, you know, those type of processes. Um, so uh, I'm going to let you hear just some uh, links to the CETA, hope that you can connect to this important center. The second one is the Artificial Intelligence Center that we're also having in Ciudad Juarez, very close to the border. So this center, uh, what it looks for is to help, um, you know, our ecosystem to develop talent in a faster way. So this center is a flexible center that is currently connected with our universities in the region, and it becomes a complement. As you know, our university curriculums, sometimes they cannot be modified uh, with the speed that we need. And thanks to the uh, AI center that we have in Juarez, we are currently uh, offering uh, more agile and more flexible programs in alliance with universities. Uh, so far, we have had more than 4,000 people in about one year that they have been trained in more advanced technologies. And more than 70% of the participants that we have had, they belong precisely to the universities um, of the region. So what we want to do here is to strengthen our capacities, uh, important for the digital economy, um, you know, all these technologies that we're talking about, we don't want to, you know, bring uh, consultants or we don't want to hire people uh, from other places uh, all the time. What we need to do is to collaborate, but we need to have local talent that is equipped with these skills and these competencies so that we can, you know, create, develop local projects, of course, in collaboration with international uh, institutions, no? And at the end, the idea is, uh, you know, how we can prepare our population so that they are reskilled or upskilled and they can uh, take advantage of the opportunities of, the, of the, what is called the digital economy and we uh, upkeep and, uh, and improve our employability rate. No? So the mission of the AI Center basically is to help our population learn these new technologies, uh, equip our population with better tools so that we can innovate, create more value added and start developing more local solutions. This AI center currently is operating uh, with very uh, young people, children, and up to uh, adults. So we have all the pipeline uh, currently participating. So you, it's, uh, you know, you we're starting to work with children uh, for them to start learning, you know, robotics or, uh, 
you know, coding or, you know, this type of needs that children currently have digital skills. But we also cover um, university students, high school students, junior high school uh, students, and currently uh, and current workers from the industry. Uh, I was telling you so far, we have had like uh, more than 4,000 people register uh, in different type of programs that go from AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, uh, cloud, uh, data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and fortunately, that is starting to happen. No? And we are very open uh, to collaborate. And, and this message is for our entrepreneurs and our companies in the region. The needs that you have uh, for making your projects or your company more competitive regarding this digital economy, contact us or come uh, to these infrastructures uh, so that we can, you know, bring real solutions to the region. It will be useless that we can have access to all these resources, but our people in the region are not requiring them or, or are not using them, right? So I got some examples here. Uh, we can help you with talent development. We can help you develop, uh, you know, innovation, take advantage of all these uh, current uh, researchers base that we have not only in the region, not only in the region, but national wide or different tools. This is another example. We recently announced uh, 50 scholarships for uh, regional entrepreneurs that they can have access to the Lonely Entrepreneur uh, Worldwide platform. So if you connect um, to the AI Center or the CETA, for example, if you look for these institutions through the website, you will, you will have a chance to, to receive one of these scholarships and to improve your entrepreneurial or uh, current company processes uh, through international tools. Well, this is just uh, the website for the AI Center. And these are just some examples. I just mentioned the AI Center, the CETA could talk about Technology Hub or other infrastructures that we have in the region. Um, and we still, uh, we're currently preparing other tools uh, that will happen soon in the Borderplex region that are gonna be here to continue supporting our uh, industries, our companies, our entrepreneurs and, and, and small businesses. Back to you, Renan. Omar, so I'm going to invite all the panelists to to, to the stage so we can uh, close with one quick question because we just got like 10 minutes uh, to end the panel. So uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you all for, for being here. And I'm going to, I'm going to shoot right away uh, to John Alex a question. Uh, I know that, that COVID kind of accelerate uh, the adoption of technology in, in all of it and in, in all of our lives. But uh, how, how really is this true in the, in the case of immersed technology, VR, uh, MR, all these uh, technologies, how, how true is it and what we need to do in order to get into it so, to, so we can uh, invest in these type of technologies uh, to try this type of technologies, and I want to go back with Marco with that, that with the try thing. And mm -hmm. but what what would be your 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 call to action for for getting this done in the industry? So definitely, COVID had quite a bit of influence on on how fast this, this started becoming adopted. Um, pre COVID, we did have quite a bit of a of a curve uh, to imp for implementation and for selling the idea of these sort of projects. Once COVID hits, and there's everybody becomes kind of uh, dispersed, uh, talking about their physical presence in, in the plants and in locations. These digital tools start making more sense as far as how can you train your personnel, how can you standardize uh, these sort of implementations. And that's where we've kind of focused on, which is uh, immersive training in the workplace. Uh, in some cases, we do, we, we create implementations that are set on the production line. And in other cases, we work on, on implementations that are done previous to the production line, which is more polishing skills, uh, reskilling or upskilling. So in those cases, uh, th th there was more of an understanding that the traditional methods of training personnel were not as effective. Um, digital tools or these types of type of solutions bring the user closer to the actual uh, tasks that they will be performing on the production line. And there's more ways for management to met to monitor the results and the progress uh, that each of these of these uh, employees or new employees, new hires are having towards the tasks that they will be completing. There's more tools and resources to actually enhance the learning process. There's more tools and resources to actually 
uh, keep tabs of the progress that these that these uh, employees are having within their training process. So uh, th there is a number of benefits that we were able to highlight and that we, we we've been highlighting, but for some reason COVID uh, did have that magical touch on how it, it accelerated and, and and kind of helped with a convincing process for management, which is usually where these projects kind of end in, in this end this loop of approvals and signatures. Uh, there there was more acceptance and adoption for these. And the quick way to to enter these, as I mentioned in my presentation, a couple of years back, we were tied to physical, uh, more robust PCs in order to use things like VR. Uh, but now standalone equipment is, is more and more accessible. It's more and more common. We're going to see quite a bit of new implementations in the upcoming years. So adoption for this should start becoming frictionless uh, quite fast. Uh, things like AR are we already have them in our hands you can use them with a mobile phone with an ipad so we've had scenarios where we were uh we were evaluating projects in vr and then they realized they had they have a hundred ipads locked in a room doing nothing so we quickly switch the projects to ar and that's quick implementation so there's devices that are already in your facilities that would quickly uh accelerate adoption for for new projects okay it's really important how how the speed of, of approval we, we uh... Uh, the impact of COVID, but let, let's see what happened now with the everyone try to settle down mm -hmm. and everything's going back to work again. And, and, and let's see what's going to happen next year with, with that and, and, and to avoid that and, and getting to barriers because we're talking about uh, getting the thing that you already have. The price is not is not an issue uh, anymore because a, a, a VR set is uh, three hundred dollars two hundred dollars and you already have uh, some of this equipment that as john alex uh, talk but the barriers that marco talk in, in his presentation marco the question is going going for you what would be the other barriers because regulation is one of them but i i think regulation is going to be like the 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 top of 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 the barriers but i think there's a lot of barriers in cultural barriers there uh, the experiment experimentation uh, mindset that the industry doesn't have uh, what would be for you uh, the first step to get into the first barrier or, or to get into, into the next uh, way to be implemented this type of technologies in the, in the medical industry right um so i think you know renee uh, the first step is you know essentially what we're trying to achieve here is you know getting getting the word out there you know because um, understanding what the technology can do and then trying to, you know, get that in ma making sure that it makes sense as far as a business to put, to invest time, effort, resources and, and money, you know, on, on this type of solutions, you know, it's worth it. You know, at the end of the day, it's going to, there's going to be a benefit, right? But our, 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 our quality systems are probably not going to be ready to take this type of technology, right? Like, if, for example, if you try to connect the training aspect of, 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 of when you do a change on your like work instruction, right? And you want to push that in, 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 in your like MR to, uh, environment, you know, you have to really connect to the quality system, right? And, you know, we're just not there yet, right? So I think, you know, getting the word out there and understanding what the benefits are and then starting with something simple, something that, you know, makes sense and that can show the benefits, it's going to get that ball rolling. So eventually we can get those very complex uh, applications going. Uh, correct. And I agree with you. I think we're really bad at uh, bragging about it. Uh, Omar was talking about I Ivan and the projects and, and we're really bad at doing it. And that's why people doesn't know what we're doing in the region. People doesn't know what you are doing, uh, uh, John Alex is doing, Omar is doing it. And I think these kind of events, these kind of panels are really important for for uh, for people to, to get to know this. And, and I will encourage everyone who is listening to us uh, to brag what we're doing in the region, to, to show what we're doing and that we're capable of that. I, I, I'm not even being able to, to make companies to get rid of Excel spreadsheets for my solution so sorry omar i, I want to get, get rid of uh, spreadsheets but uh, but I, I think we need to communicate we need to collaborate and we need to do it more and to 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 do a final uh, remark omar uh, this this is not, not kind of a question but what would be the, the thing that we need to do uh, in order to first 
to know all the things that are already happening in the in the region. I know that you're really you're doing a really amazing work in uh, with with TechSpark, JJ also in the Paso region. But what would be the thing that we need to do in order to get more people involved, to get more industries involved with us? Yeah. Uh, uh, the bridge is doing a, an amazing job, also of course. Uh, and what would be the the thing that you recommend us and yeah. the, all the people that listen to us? to tell the, everyone, hey, let's do this, because in order to get into the next to yeah. the next uh, step, let's just stop. Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Rene. And, 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 I, and I wish that everyone that is here connected uh, would help us, you know, uh, because we th that, that question need, needs an answer from everyone. Because fortunately, our region is currently growing, you know, economically speaking. Uh, different to other regions in the world, we still have, you know, uh, employability and our employability rate is really high. So when we talk with people about the challenges that the digital economy is going to bring, sometimes people don't believe that, no? Because we are busy, you know, we're still generating jobs and we're still, you know, selling, etc. So we tell, we tell our people, you know, let's get ready because digital economy is here. We need to get ready with this type of tools, etc. And sometimes I see that super far, no? Because like I said before, fortunately, our region is uh, economically strong. But things are going to change. Things are starting to change already. And little by little, that's that's going to happen. So in, in the next years, five years, I, I, I'm sure that we're going to start to feel that, you know, real uh, digital economy in our region too. So my invitation uh, to, you know, families, to students, to teachers, um, you know, company leaders, entrepreneurs is that we should wonder ourselves, what is it that I am doing to get ready for the digital economy? No, am, am I doing nothing because I'm okay? And, and that should be like a red flag for us. You know, everyone in our region should start preparing either, you know, ourselves or our companies or our processes uh, with digital economy tools. And if we're not doing that, I, like I said before, those are red flags for what's, what, what is starting to happen. And I, I would invite everyone um, in Chihuahua State, Chihuahua City, uh, El Paso, Juarez, Las Cruces, etc., what we call the waterplex, to wonder what is it that we are doing in order to be ready for the digital economy. Thank you, Mar. It's really important what you said. And I, I'm just going to close this panel because we are already out of time. Uh, and, and thank thank everyone to be for being here. Thank for for the bio El, El Paso Juarez uh, organization for getting getting all these people together in order to promote what we're doing in the region. And I will invite you, everyone who's listening to us, Omar said, to be this change agent that we need in a, in our region. To be this change agent in your company, in your family, in your work, in your day to day basis. Be this this change agent to, we need in order to get into these technologies, in order to be more productive, in order to get to grow faster. As Omar said, we have a really good uh, economy in the region, but we can we can be bigger, we can be, grow faster, we can do a lot of stuff. And, and to get advantage of the talent, the people who live in, the region, in El Paso, New Mexico, and Juarez, they are really, really uh, uh, there and they are doing a lot of good stuff. They are doing accomplishing a lot of stuff in their company that are working right now. So I invite you, everyone, to be this change agent and to uh, promote and brag about what we're doing in the region. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for inviting me. And Omar, uh, the Ivan, Marco, and John Alex, thank you for this panel. And see you in, in, in the next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Irving.